Shalom Aras Tesari. This is Rosh Hashanah. This is the Zikarona Teruah. This is the Yom Teruah. This is the festival or the feast of the blowing of trumpets. Bamarinyan Nemharik is known as the Meleket, the Meleket Ken, the Meleket Ken, or the Trumpet Day, the day of blowing trumpet, which corresponds to New Year's, and generally speaking to our Ethiopic New Year, which is usually September 11th and September 12th. Now, the Hebrew New Year's coincide with, as the other holy days and holidays, with the lunar, the lunar cycle, and for important reason. Now, Rosh Hashanah means the head of the year, and it's called the Jewish New Year. More correctly, it should be referenced as the blowing of trumpets or the feast of trumpets and there's a very important biblical and scriptural reason and connection with the trumpets it is the first of the high holy days or what's known as the yamim norayim the namim norayim or the days of awe the days of awe which celebrates the ten days, the ten days before the Day of Atonement, or the ten days before Yom Kippur. Now, Rosh Hashanah is observed on the first two days of Tishrei, which is the seventh month in the Hebrew calendar. It is described in the Torah as a day of screaming or the shouting of trumpets or the shouting of the shofar, which is the ram's horn. Now, this particular day, as we have touched on, is observed by prayers and praying in the Mikorab. The Mikorab, which is an Ethiopic word, refers to the synagogue and it's also a day where the observance is the hearing and the listening to the shofar or the sound of the meliket or the kende meliket the ram's horn now festive meals are served with what's known as khala which is a type of a white bread that is usually um, baked and twisted. It's twisted and it's braided type of bread. Now, there are symbolic foods, and the symbology in the foods are, are very important, but the symbolic foods which are eaten on this civil New Year's Day, the blowing of the trumpet, the beginning of the days of awe leading up to Yom Kippur or the Day of Atonement are apples, apples dipped in honey, fish, fish heads, as well as new fruits on the second night. But most important, since it's a high holy day, it's a high holy Shabbat or Sedenbet day, there is a refraining from work or manual labor. Now, what is related to this particular day and time is the Yom Kippur. And the Yom Kippur is the Day of Atonement. Now, Rosh Hashanah has certain key significances. It marks the start, Hebraically speaking, of a new year according to the Hebrew calendar. Now, other Jews, speaking of the German and the Polish Jews and the Ashkenazi Jews and certain Sephardic Jews, but mainly the Ashkenazi Jews, they observe it slightly different than what is prescribed scripturally. For example, this is one of four quote, New Year observances 
that define various legal, quote, years for different purposes as explained in the Mishnah and the Talmud. And we will, Yah willing, be touching on the Mishnah and the Talmud in order to give our people a better understanding as well as an application of the Mishnah and Talmud vis-a-vis -vis our Ethiopic Talmud or Timherit or teachings, i.e. the teachings of His Imperial Majesty and the testimony of the Moshiach, Yehoshua, Jesus Christos, our Black Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, this particular new year is a new year for people. It's a new year for animals. It's a new year for all legal contracts. The Mishnah, which is a, a supplement, uh, one of the first sections of the Talmud, it also sets this day aside as the new year for calculating calendar years and sabbatical or the Shemitah and the Jubilee years or the Yovel, which we call Ethiopically the e Yobelu, the Jubilee years. Now, many of the Jews, they believe that Rosh Hashanah figuratively represents, or in a literal sense, the creation of the world, the world, or the universe, the Alem, or the Olam. However, according to one particular view that's found in the Talmud, and that particular view is of Rabbi Eliezer, Rosh Hashanah, it commemorates the creation of man which entails that five days earlier, the 25th of the month of Elul, was the first day of the creation of the universe. Now, this five days that the Jews say um, was actually that first day in creation, we find this within our Ethiopic or the solar calendar, as the month of Apagume, the month of Apagume. Now, when we trace this now to the roots and to the Ethiopic source and the headwaters of the Nile in connection with ancient Egypt, we find that these five days, the first or the original gods or Elohim family, that divine family of Osar, of Oset, of Haru, of uh, Set or Sut, and of uh, some say Hathor or Nebhet, this royal family, and we will touch on that. It's all connected, and it's all connected in a beautiful way once one is able to put the matters into their proper context. And this we hope to do, Yah willing, and present it to you, our brothers and sisters, and of course, to the mothers. Now, furthermore, in the Mishnah, which is one of the core texts of modern Judaism's oral Torah, it contains the first known reference to Rosh Hashanah as the Day of Judgment, or the Yom Hadin. In the Talmud uh, tracted on Rosh Hashanah, it states that three books of account are opened on Rosh Hashanah, wherein the fate of the wicked, the righteous, and those of an intermediate class and classification are recorded, or those who we call of the middle, of the middle region. The names of the righteous or the Khan are immediately inscribed in what's known as the Hewet Metzhaf or the Book of Life. And they are sealed to live, Lechayim, for life, Lehiwet. The middle class are allowed 
those who are not wicked and those who are not good per se. They are of the middle class. And the middle class are allowed a respite. And here's where we get the respite of 10 days or what's called the 10 days of awe until Yom Kippur, until the Day of Atonement. To do what? To repent and to become Sadiq, to become Sadiq Khan, to become righteous. The wicked, on the other hand, Allah they are blotted out of the book, the book of the living forever and ever and ever. Now, in the Hebrew Kedase or the Jewish liturgy, Rosh Hashanah is described as the Day of Judgment or Yom Hadin. And it's also called the Day of Remembrance or Yom HaZikaron. Now there are some uh, Midrashic descriptions that depict God, that depicts Hashim as sitting upon a throne, while books containing the deeds of all of humanity are opened for review, and each person passing in front of him for evaluation of his or her respective deeds or misdeeds. Now, the Talmud, which we know Ethiopically as the Timherit or the teaching, provides three central ideas behind the day. Quote, Kedusu, the Holy One said, on Rosh Hashanah recite before me verses of sovereignty, remembrance, and shofar blast, or what's called the Malachuyot, the Zikronot, and the Shofrot. Sovereignty, so that you should make me your king. Remembrance, so that your remembrance should rise before me. And through what? Through the shofar or the ram's horn. And this is according to the tractic on Rosh Hashanah, 16a, 34b. This idea, this hasa, this thought, is reflected in the Tselotat, or the prayers composed by the classical rabbinic sages for Rosh Hashanah found in all Machzorim, where the theme of the Tselotat, or prayers, is the strongest theme, and this being the theme of the coronation of God as king of the universes in preparation for the acceptance of judgments that will follow on that day, symbolized as, quote, written in a divine book of judgments that then hang in the balance for 10 days, waiting for all to repent then they will be sealed on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. The assumption is that everyone was sealed for life, and therefore the next festival is Sukkot, or Tabernacles, which we have here in the three feasts as the third, which is also called in gathering that is referred to and quite appropriately as the time of our joy or Ziman Simhatenu Simhatenu Ziman Simhatenu the time of I and I joy the time of our joy my brothers and sisters 
this is a key to understanding revelation. Everything that we read and we shared with you concerning Rosh Hashanah, which the Jews and Judaism has interpreted, can and should be understood in light of the book of Revelation. Every single thing, the blowing of the trumpets, the ten days, if you recall, in the book of Revelation, there is a mention of ten days. And if you ask most Christians who are unfamiliar with the root of Christianity, this messianic way, they will be at a total loss to explain the book of Revelation. And this is one reason why the book of Revelation has not been explained in most churches and most churches do not even deal with the book of Revelation because of the symbology and because of their lack of a foundation in the Old Testament and in the Old Covenant. It's very important for us to understand this. When we look into the book of Revelation and let us go there together just to touch on these ten days because this is the first of these particular ten days, which are known as the ten days of awe. So let's go to Revelation chapter 2. And in Revelation chapter 2, let us touch on the chapter from the very beginning. And this, according to Schofield, those who have the Schofield Study Bible, of course, please study along with us with the Schofield Study Bible in the English because the reference and the study notes are excellent, especially for those who seek to have a grounded idea of Christina, of Christianity, of true Christianity on its Hebraic or its Judaic roots. Now, the part two, this is the part two, and it says the things which are. And here's where it begins to speak of the seven churches, where Johannes, John, Johannes means the grace, Hana, of Eo, or Eo, Hana, which Johannes is the grace of Yah or Yah's grace. And this book is a book of grace. If one is able to stand spiritually in the holy place, in their heart and in their mind, in other words, with knowledge, with knowing. Now, here... The first message is to Ephesus, the church of Ephesus. And a point on church needs to be made because in our notes concerning Rosh Hashanah and the observance of Rosh Hashanah, no doubt you should recall that the key observance of Rosh Hashanah is the hearing of the trumpet is the hearing of what is known as the shofar. Let us give you another sample of the shofar. Please listen. Simu, simu, it means listen and pay attention.
Amen. Now there's a breakdown of that, and we'll go through the breakdown of each particular horn blowing, each particular shofar blowing. Now, from what I hear, the shofar, to blow the shofar, it takes some practice. And even the, the making of the shofar and what the shofar is, which is, we call it the Kenda Meliket Bamarinya. And in the Amharic, this is the, the horn or the, the ram's horn is the good interpretation. The ram's horn. And now, uh, this ram's horn, the, the whole making of the ram's horn, it is, it's a miracle in itself. It, it, it's a real uh, ta'amrat, a ta'amrat. We say ta'amrat to say a miracle in itself. And please, if you have an opportunity, please do some research on the making of the shofar. And then there is interpretation or Torguame of the meaning at each stage of the making of the ram's horn. Now, no doubt some of y'all who are familiar with the, the mishtir or the mystery out of ancient Egypt might have heard of the name of Kunum. Kunum was that um, symbology of Yahweh as the ram head God or Creator that made man similar to Ptah or Fitta, the Father, on the potter's wheel. And throughout the scripture, we have reference to the potter and the potter's wheel. And unless you are familiar with the wisdom that Moses, Musa, Moshe, our lawgiver, was learned in then it's impossible to understand it in its proper context. Now, Kunum has the ram's horns, has the ram's horns. Now, this particular holy day and high holy day, one of the interesting significances, and we touched on it earlier, let's see if we can bring this up for you at this particular time concerning this holy day. Um, let's see if we have this here. Um, and we touched on it a little bit earlier. Give me one moment to find it because there's a lot much more to this. And please, if you have a have an opportunity, um, go look this up. Wikipedia has a very good a general page. That gives some general information, but it's, it's, it's highly advised to check it out. Let us um, let us go like let us go like this. Okay, let us go like this. All right. Uh, excuse me, my brothers and sisters. Please um, stay. Uh, okay, here we go. We have it. It was under the etymology. And we touched on this in the first part. And this, let's just go over it again. A redundancy or repetition is good, especially in the good thing. Repetition is very good. Now, the etymology of Rosh Hashanah, as we discussed already, Rosh Hashanah does not appear in the Hebrew Bible or the Torah. It does not appear in the Orit or the Old Testament or the Bible at all. However, in Leviticus 23 and 24, it is found and it refers to the festival of the first day of the seventh month, which is called in the Hebrew the Zikarona Teruah, the Zikarona Teruah, the memorial with blowing of horn or the memorial of trumpets or the trumpet memorial. Numbers 29 and 1 calls this festival Yom Teruah, or the day of blowing the horn, and symbolizes a number of subjects. Make a note of that. It symbolizes many scriptural and biblical subjects, such as, 
and this is important, such as the binding of Yishak. No doubt you all recall where Abraham, our father, Abraham, the father of the faith, the friend of God, of Hashem, he was asked to sacrifice the love of his son for the one who gave him this son after such a long wait. And that particular story is interesting because many get it twisted, not understanding the real context. They think that the Almighty Hashem wanted Abraham to kill his son. Abraham, no doubt, thought this because he was surrounded by those who did child sacrifices. And therefore he thought that if this is what is required of him, though he lamented it somewhat, he would be faithful. And when he got to that point of the binding and the sacrifice of his only son, and understand that connection with Yeshua, our black Lord and Savior, his only son, Yishak, what was seen? He was an angel stopped him and pointed him to the thicket. And in this thicket, a ram was caught by its end or kendoch, by its horns in that thicket. Now, what is interesting is that one of the subject matters that the Yom Teruah signifies, as well as the Zikaron, the Zikaron Teruah signifies, is the binding of Yishak, the binding of Isaac, Abraham's only son, the sacrifice of his only son, and the animal sacrifices that were to be performed. Now, if you do a little bit of study and you go behind the text and go into the Hebrew, if you will, go into the Ethiopic or more importantly, go into the royal Amharic of the Metzhaf Kedus, his Imperial Majesty's Bible, the Book of the Seven Seals, Metzhaf Kedusit. And you go to that particular narration and you read the text, you will find there's a very interesting name. And the particular name that is associated with this particular text, which is very interesting, is Sobek. Sobek. Yes, Sobek. For those of you all who are familiar with ancient Egypt, you will understand Sebek and Sobek. There's a connection with ancient Egypt. Now, the ram now, according to the Hebrew, is now connected with this deity or god or netter of ancient Egypt known as Sobek. And the ram that is called Sobek, both in the Hebrew and in the royal Amharic of the Metzhaf Kedus, or Haile Selassie's Bible, our father's Bible, the book of the seven seals, the book that the line of the tribe of Judah fulfilled in real time, you will find this name Sobek. Now, Sobek is connected with both ancient Egypt, the ram, the ram's horn. Now, what about the ram's horn? The ram's horn signifies a certain, a rational quality to the revelation. The, the, the ram's horn signifies a rational quality to the revelation. But there's more. Now, we're going to touch on this more, but we want just to give you some very important notes that you can look up on your own. And please, y'all willing, stay tuned where we will touch on this in more detail. Just speak on Sobek and that connection with the binding of Yishak and ancient Egypt and the mysteries that Moses was learned in. I, 
Acts of the Apostles, Acts of the Apostles, I think is 7 and 22, it states that Moses was learned in the wisdom of the Egyptians, more correctly, of the Egypts. And he was mighty in word and deed. And, of course, that was demonstrated in his contest against Pharaoh. Some say that Pharaoh was his stepbrother, Tutmos III. And from our Ethiopic reconstruction of the Exodus and the Genesis and Exodus story, we see that no doubt that is true. So Moses, Moshe, was familiar with this. But there's much more to that, and, and we want to touch on the much more to that. But we don't want to go too far off of the particular course and the particular study right here. It's just to remind ones, Acts of the Apostles, chapter 7, verse 22. Let us just read this. You should be familiar with this, but for those who might not be familiar with this, because ones may ask, why are we always talking about Egypt? Why we we were trying to compare Egypt? And some not being learned, as we say, get it twisted. In Acts of the Apostles, Yehwariyat Sera, Mi'rafa Sabatukut Era. Hayahulet, and notice it's in verse 2-2. It's in verse 22. And yes, we say that there is a significance to the fact that it's found in verse 22. It says, And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. It should not read Egyptians. It should read Egypts, the Gibbetoch. It doesn't say the Gibbet Awiyan, it says the Gibbet Och. So Gibbet is Egypt and Gibbet Och is Egypt. And it says, and he was mighty in words and deeds. Instead of plural words and deeds, it should be he was mighty in word and deed. And indeed, he was mighty in word and in deed. That means that he understood this mystery of God and Christ, of God and the Moshiach, of the Father and the Son. The mystery of the Father and the Son. In other words, the degenerate goddess or maternal worship of mother and child now was superseded now by the father and sonship. So when in the old it was mother and child, now the father and son. This is why he says, I have called my son, my son. This is Old Testament where the Almighty says that he has a son. This means that Israel is the Son of God. And we, therefore, as Beta Israel, are the children of God, or are the Bani Ha Elohim, the children of the true God. Now, there's much significance to that. So, Acts of the Apostles demonstrates this quite clearly. Let us continue in the book of Revelation so we can understand the significance of understanding Yom Teruah or Zikaron Teruah, which the other Jews have called Rosh Hashanah, even though Rosh Hashanah is not found in the Hebrew Bible. So we need to understand that right there. Rosh Hashanah. It is a type of Rosh Hashanah. For example, Ezekiel 40 and 1 says that there's a general reference to the time of Yom Kippur as the beginning of the year. But it is not referring specifically, a key note, it's not referring specifically to the holiday or the high holy day of 
Rosh Hashanah. So Rosh Hashanah should be known as Yom Teruah. It, it, it should be known as the day of trumpet or the day of trumpets or the feast of trumpets. This is its rightful al kidan or covenant signification. So, Revelation chapter 2, where we were at. Now, the first uh, synagogue or church in the New Testament tense, sense is a church. You understand? But the early churches was based on the Mikurab or the synagogue. But we were kicked out of the synagogues. Therefore, those who were ekkalio, ekkalio, they were called out. They were called out. They became the ecclesia. And ecclesia is the Greek word for church. So we need to understand why do we call it church. You see, a lot of folks are churchy people, but they don't even understand why it's called church or what is the actual origin or reason for the church. So the church basically means the called out ones, those who were called out from the older form of the traditional gathering or the synagogue worship, you understand, and those because of their admittance in our black Lord and Savior, Getachina Med Hanetachin Jesus Christos, in Yeshua HaMoshi, they now form their own gathering, and that gathering became known as the Ecclesia, or as what we call in translation, church. Now, so the first message now is to Ephesus. Now, Ephesus is the church, becomes the church at the end of what is known as the apost apostolic, the apostolic age or the age of the apostles. And at this point, the first love that the early church, the early ecclesia, the called out ones had for Yahweh in and through the name and authority of Moshiach was lost. And when we look at the seven churches, they show us seven ages. There are seven significant ages that are mentioned by each of the churches. And we would trace each of the seven churches. We will find that it is a prophecy and a prediction or a summary of the seven different stages until the return of Christ in his kingly character, and now we are in the last church age, or the church that's known as Laodicea. Laodicea. Now, Laodicea, which is the Ethiopic way of reference, Laodicea, is, the, first of all, what does the name mean? This is one thing that we teach our Dek Amazamorit and the disciples of the King of Kings and his Christ is, when we're studying, when we are in Bible or Torah or scriptures, or even when we're learning anything, it is good to find out what is the meaning of the particular word as best as we can. Get to the root. Get to the etymology. So here with Ladokia, or the church, the end-time church of Laodicea, the meaning is judgment to the people or the judgment or justice of the people. Now, we notice that justice and judgment, these are very, very important themes in this particular secular age, justice. You know, the lost sheep, the Negroes that don't recognize that they are Hebrews, they are always opining about no justice, no peace. You see, because they don't recognize that the true wellspring of justice is the Kal Kidan, is the Kal Kidan, is the covenant. The covenant is our wellspring. This is where justice begins when we are in contract or in covenant with the King of Kings and his Christ. There and only there we have justice and judgment. 
because he alone is just. But in the secular world, have you noticed how many shows are on TV now? How many court shows are on TV? How many different type of court shows we see on TV nowadays? And, and, and so we're living in a very liturgic, uh, lit, uh, uh, litigious, a very litigious sort of age. You understand? A very adversarial sort of an age. Legally speaking, everyone wants to take somebody to court and sue somebody before the courts to get what they think is so-called justice or judgment. So we're in the seventh church age right now. But now in our study right here in connection with Rosh Hashanah or Aras Hasanah, is a more correct way, aras, because the word rosh and the word aras is one and the same. Hebrew say rosh. In the Ethiopic, it is ris, ris, ris in the Ethiopic. In the Royal Amharic, we say aras. In Arabic as well, it's rais. So we see that in the Shemitic language, the word is one and the same. So in this reading, we're going to begin with the message to Ephesus. But where we want to get to and touch on is what is known as these ten days, the ten days of awe. So please, my brothers and sisters, stay tuned for the ten days of awe. 